What's up, Night Nation? This is Alan Levin from UCF Football Updates on Instagram, and this is the UCF Football Updates podcast episode number three, featuring another former UCF football player. Last time we spoke with DN Thomas Niles. Today, we speak with another UCF defensive legend, a former first-team All-America, All-AAC player, and Fiesta Bowl MVP linebacker Terrence Plummer. Thanks for joining us, JTP. How's it going? <laughs> Going good. Thanks for having me, man. I can't uh, wait to talk about UCL, man. I love it. Yeah, man. Me too. I, I'm I'm really appreciative you joining. So, I mean, first thing I got to get into before we get into your career and everything is, man, this is probably the most wild offseason I've ever witnessed, not just for UCF, but for college football as a whole, which I'll definitely want to ask you some questions about that. I mean, you had the NIL going into effect. You have all this conference realignment with Texas and OU. But from a UCF standpoint, we had a coaching change. We had an AD change, um, a lot of crazy, you know, a lot of transfers came in. Um, you know, what's your thoughts on just UCF's offseason, bringing in, obviously, Terry Mahajer as our AD, and then, of course, uh, you know, Gus Malzahn comes over from Auburn. So what were your thoughts as, you know, as a former player, just seeing all this, uh, you know, movement for UCF? Um, this is what we all envisioned. That's why we came to UCF. Um just being honest, uh, from when I was recruited to come there, we were thinking about going into the Big East, and uh, that was a big major selling point for me. But it, it ended up being we came to the American, you know, because the Big East was taken apart. But right, this is what we literally used to talk about. Like, we if we win these games now, look, you think about where our university can be, because like everybody understands that like UCF's like we're young, we're just so young when it comes to everything we've done. Like we, the way we moved up from Division three to Division one is just unheard of. Yeah. You know, from 79 to now, and this is where we are. So, like, it's just like when I see it, I'm like, I'm like, dang, man, I, I love to see that UCF is on the the um plateau that it is now. And uh, we rile up the big schools, boy. We get them riled. <laughs> yeah, uh, we do. Oh, my goodness. So, that being an underdog, but then also being the underdog who wins, like, I just love everything that UCF got going on right now. I really do. Absolutely. All right. So are you, did you like the Gus Malzahn move? Are you happy with that hire? I mean, the players were campaigning obviously for uh, Jeff Levy, the OC at Ole Miss, who used to be obviously at UCF. Um, but, you know, we ended up obviously hiring Gus Malzahn. Did you like the move? Do you think that he's the right guy to lead uh, UCF into, you know, where we're heading? I really do because of the fact that with, with Gus, he's a little older and he's already been in that SEC like, you know, he's been, he's, he's you know, Gus Malzahn actually coached against me in college when he was at Tulsa. So, like, it shows mm-hmm. that, like, he's, like, he's, like, worked his way up the ranks and then what he's been able to do with Auburn and everything like that. But Gus, all, he has, like, when I hear him talk, he has this uh, certain uh, feeling about him that lets me know that he thinks this is a top job. Like, yeah. there's nothing, you know what I mean? Like, I love Coach Frost for sure, and I, and I like Coach Hyper. Um you know, I thought Scott Frost was amazing, but with his whole journey and where he had took UCF, I saw that team, you know, him building it up into where now, you know, it's at this elite level. And Coach Heupel did it for a year. And, um, you know, the next year, they kind of, you know, I ain't like to fall off the next few years. Yeah. Like that that kind of, you know, especially with the tangent that we're going, I'm like, and thinking about the conference that we're at and the recruits that we could get, I just didn't like that we kind of tailed off. But I think with Gus, like I just think Gus got a lot of got a lot of experience in the SEC. He um he understands how like like plentiful the Florida soil is. Like these recruits we've been getting, these young boys, we got a, we got we got we got Florida mad at us from taking recruits. We got, yeah. we got te- you know what I'm saying? Like we got the big schools like like really heated. But that's like what Gus brings, and he said he would. And he he kind of delivering on what he said, which means a lot to me. Like if you're gonna be a coach, you know. You know, if you're talking about these certain aspects of where you want to win and what you want to see this program to be, you start, you know, hitting that checklist. I love it, man. You, you a manly word. Now, let's see about, you know, football in the fall, see how everything goes. But I do like Gus Miles on being hot for sure. I agree, man. I mean, it's so funny. I was so like when the players were campaigning for Levy, you know, you naturally want to get behind them. So I was like, all right, I'm all in on Levy. And then you start hearing that he's going to bring Kevin Smith with him. I'm like, oh, hell yeah, we're bringing back 24K. But then, you know, you you kind of didn't realize, like what I didn't realize is like, or you forget is that like, Gus Malzahn is like a coaching legend. Like he was easily a top 10, top 15 coach when he was at Auburn. Too. So when you bring him in, you get this whole different level of pedigree that not to say anything against Levy, but he would have been a first time head coach. You know what I mean? So you bring in 
Amal's on and the respect kind of kicks in instantly and you see what he's doing for, for UCF, uh, getting us even more on the map and, uh, and bringing in these recruits. So I agree with you a hundred percent. Um, but you know, before we'll talk a lot about UCF, but I want to talk a little bit about you and what you're up to. Um, obviously you played for the Washington football team in the NFL for a little bit. Um, you've been in the CFL where you won the gray cup. Uh, you've been in the AFL, the XFL. So kind of talk about, you know, where your football journey is right now. I know the XFL kind of recently folded. That was, I think your most recent team that you were on. So kind of just talk a little bit about your journey over the last few years, playing in a couple of different leagues for different teams and kind of where it stands right now. Yeah, um, so my career has just been like, you know, ever since I left college, you know, I've been kind of the guy, like a mercenary, kind of been everywhere, man. Um, so I was in the NFL in 2015, 2016 with the Washington football team, uh, ended up getting released by them, and then I was with the Minnesota Vikings for the rest of that year. So that was yep. pretty cool, like, seeing how one organization was run versus the other. Um, you know, uh, Washington was a great place to learn. learn. I, got, I had some great coaches, some great guys around me. Um, but when I got to Minnesota, I really love Minnesota. I was around Chad Greenway, Adrian Peterson. Yeah. Uh, this is Stefan Diggs when he's a rookie. Same swag that he got now, but nobody <laughs> really knew, you know? Um, yeah. So, like, it was just a really fun time. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I feel like with my NFL journey, I just kind of was one of those things that, you know, I was always – my teammates always respected me. They thought I was a ball player. But, you know, I wasn't really the the the, the biggest linebacker, the fastest linebacker. I was just kind of the kid who made plays. So, it was kind of hard for me to find a fit. And, you know, with the NFL, you got to have somebody who falls in love with you, regardless of, you know, uh, you know, height, speed, talent. They just kind of believe in the guy that you are, what you can do. And, uh, you know, I, I was out of the NFL after two years. Then I headed up to Canada. Um, Canada was a great experience. I got, to live in a, I got to live in another country for two years. I was in Toronto, so that was beautiful. Yeah. You know, um, I got to, you know, really travel around there, learn about, uh, you know, what they do in Canada and everything like that. And I won a great cup too. So it was pretty special. You know, a lot of yeah. people back home didn't understand how special it was, but the people in Canada and I, you know, me being in the CFL kind of understood it. So it was like a great experience. I had met some great teammates there. Also won that with Troy Davis, Diesel Davis. Oh, no way. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know he was on the, I didn't know he was on Toronto. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that was cool to win another championship with one of the boys. So, and then, um, I had got hurt in 2018. I tore my meniscus and I had, uh, uh, bad back, you know, sciatica, and I was young, and I actually had an opportunity to get back down to the NFL, but because of the injury, um, wasn't able to do it, you know, so from that time, from 2018 to about 2019, I'm trying to figure it out, just kind of a free agent, then the uh, AF comes, and uh, I'm about to, uh, I actually signed to the Apollos, yep. which, which is a funny story, because a lot of UCF players, players there, <laughs> huh? I said there's a lot of UCF players on that squad, right? For sure, man. You had uh, Jordan McRae on that team. You had Chris uh, Martin, right? Yeah, Chris Martin, my college roommate, Rennell Hall. So, yep. like, I was, I was, and we were playing at, bo at the bounce house. I was like, oh, I need to, <laughs> oh. So, uh, you know, the day I come down there, though, because they uh, actually tried to pick me up later in the season, I signed, uh, I drive down to Orlando, and uh, the league goes under that same day. So, I'm getting my physical, and the doctor tells me, man, you can't even finish, man. Uh, the league is no, no more need your services. So, you know, I had, I had, well, I didn't get to play in it, but I was signed in the AAF and then that dropped. And then uh, I kind of had to wait again. XFL came back around and I got to play for Tampa Bay. But like I said, I had been out for an injury. So like by the time that I was catching my groove, starting to make some more plays, starting out there on the defense, you know, the league ended. So yeah. where I'm at currently in my journey, I'm training kids now, which I really love to do. I'm a sports scientist. That's what I like to call myself. Nice. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I do that. And I'm at a good gym. And uh, also at the gym, I train. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the best shape of my life. I actually learn, you know, I feel like I feel like people give up on older guys, even though I'm a little bit older. I'm still young, but I'm a little bit older now. And people like, you know, once you get phased out, they don't realize that, you know, if you can go back to the drawing board, work on your game, work on your body, that, you know, you can get in even better shape. All I need is an opportunity with some knowledge, you know? So yeah, that's just what I'm going at right now to try to get in the best shape I can, working on my knowledge of my body and everything like that. And if I get an opportunity to spin again, it's going to be all glory to God because I'm just going to, I'm a ball harder than I ever have, man. I missed the game. Yeah, man. No, I hear that. Are you, so are you like trying to maybe get back in the CFL or the NFL or kind of wherever the opportunity uh, arises? 
I just want I just want to go wherever the opportunity arises, and then from there, you know, if I put some stuff together and somebody sees fit to put me in those bigger levels, you know, I'm I'm ready and willing to go. You know, um, I just I, my my model is just stay ready. You don't have to get ready. You know, so <laughs> with with some with some good with some good film and uh, you know me taking care of my body, I see I, sky's the limit basically in my eyes. It's just waiting on the opportunity. Well, speaking of good film, we know you you have. UCF highlights for days. Um, obviously, you know, you're one of the maybe two, three best linebackers in school history. Um, and you were on some pretty good teams. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of those teams that you were on. But I'm curious, as a, as a former player, um, what's it like to see this growth of UCF? I mean, when you were there, obviously, we had one of our best seasons ever. But when you talk about, you know, from the time that you were there to now, where, you know, we had two undefeated regular seasons back to back, you know, we win the Peach Bowl. We're in the top 25 almost year in, year out right now. We're spitting out NFL players on the regular basis. What's it like to see, um, you know, this growth from the, for the, from the program? It's beautiful. It's beautiful, man. Um, like I was saying before, like with just everything that's happened uh, with them going, the 2017 season was such a thrill to watch. As just a fan, I got to be a part of the 2013 plan, but to see the 2017 uh, team and see that uh, whole season, how it unfolded, um, it just really opened my eyes to where UCF was really headed to. I just I just saw us on a whole different plateau, even from our Fiesta Bowl year when we went undefeated and won that Peach Bowl versus Auburn. Like, I just I, – and I watched the game with Thomas Niles and Brandon Alexander. Nice. Right across the street from the school that day. And, uh, you know, I forget the uh, rest. I think it's Bar Louie. We watched okay. the game with my wife and my and my um, sister-in-law, my brother-in-law. And uh, it was just like, I, I guess I guess that's how the fans felt when we won the Fiesta Bowl, I guess. Because with the feel, I was like, oh, my goodness, y'all, boys. We just we just took another <laughs> step. Yeah, we, we just did. just off another block. We almost there where they're going to have to respect us as the top people in this state. And uh, or in this country, you know, yeah. that's how I felt at the time. And just like seeing seeing the games like the the, the, the Memphis game where uh, we face adversity and, um, you know, it's a high score game. We're going back and forth and people don't realize in that game how much NFL talent was on both sides of the field. Oh, both sides. Oh, yeah. They were trying to they were trying to jip us that year, trying to say we didn't deserve to be in the college football playoff. But if you look at it, the, the, the starting the starting two wide receivers on Memphis side, quarterback plus two running backs are in the NFL. Yeah. On our oh, yeah. side. On yeah. our side, Traquan, Gabriel, McKenzie. I think McKenzie can make it in the NFL. That's just my personal opinion. Adrian Killens, NFL. I mean, there's a lot of guys that were on the you, NFL. You know what I'm saying? All these guys that were in that game and it showed, and I and I saw that. So then it's like, okay, we're looking at my team's playing, we're playing the top teams in the nation. And plus we have NFL talent at our school. That is nothing, that is everything we wanted from UCF. Consistent NFL talent, consistent wins, knocking off big teams. That's what we've always had at UCF. And now they're just taking it another level. So I'm hoping now that we got Coach Miles on, he can take it to the another level. Okay, let's get let's 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 get this conference championship this year. They're already doubting us at number two behind Cincinnati. You know, like just prove just prove that UCF, the soil that we come from, is just a little bit different than everybody else. So I just love it, man. I just think my school is just like we really like David versus Goliath, knocking down the Goliaths, man. Slowly. Slowly. Yeah, we are. Well, it's interesting. I love that you brought up the, the NFL thing because that's how I've always said when, you know, on my account, I get a lot of, you know, haters on there. They're power five fans that come up and say like UCF couldn't do our schedule. UCF couldn't just, and I say, you know, the way you want to look at a team that could compete with anyone is look at how many NFL players they have on the roster. If we have NFL talent, that means we have real talent on the team because everyone's like, Oh, there's, you know, you're not as deep from, you know, the top of the roster, the bottom, like we have NFL talent. That's that to me proves that you have a, a true squad. You know what I mean? And so, and you look at that 2017 team when, you know, they said, Oh, well, you couldn't have beat Alabama. You come like, look, almost everyone on that offense on the offensive side of the ball, like at least in the skill positions in the NFL, then you had all the defensive players, you know, you had, you know, you had Shaquem, you had Mike Hughes. I mean, you had all these guys that are in the NFL at Tristan Hill. We're still getting guys from that squad that are going, I mean, even Jordan Franks, a tight end. I mean, was in the NFL. I mean, so yeah. we had a ton of talent on that team. So I hate when people, you know, I, you know, one question I have for you is, I mean, 
you were, uh, you know, you played several power five opponents as a member of UCF, you know, while you were there, you played South Carolina, Penn state, Baylor, you know, just to name a few, how different is the talent between a power five school like that? And then a quote unquote group of five school like UCF. And I, and I know there's some group of five schools that are nowhere near some of these levels, but we're talking about like a UCF, an av- you know, above average UCF team, like, like some of the ones you've seen the last couple of years versus, you know, these South Carolina's Penn state, when you're on the field, how different is the talent? Are you like, are you overwhelmed by the power five talent? Or are you guys like, no, we can hang with any of these guys. I, I personally feel, and if, and if you look at my stats and my games, whenever I played against anybody power five, those are like my best games. Cause I wanted yeah. to show that like, uh, I just wanted to show that, <laughs> I belonged on the field with my peers. And I yes. think all of us at UCF during that time, that was our main focus. But like, let's, if you really, if you really break it down to how, you know, what it is, it's, it took us, it took us longer to get to those moments. It was just a build up. So freshman year, my freshman year at UCF, we had all the talent in the world, but we just didn't put it together and we ended up five and seven. Mm-hmm, I remember and that. We, then, but that, but that year, we, the, the freshmen on the team, you know, my class, we, we, we play, a lot of us played and we got, you know, kind of birthed in that fire. So like people don't be, believe in sometimes putting players out in that fire because they think it's going to mess with their confidence or whatever it is. But me, I'm looking at it as like, okay, I got to be out there. I saw I was productive. I didn't do as well as I could, but now I know I'm, I'm able to be amongst my peers. Mm-hmm. So when we played in 2013 in uh, uh, the Fiesta Bowl year, we had, our, everybody that was our starters could play in the NFL, and they almost all did on offense. They all did. Yeah. And if you look at defense, eight of eight or eight out of eleven of us all got a shot in the NFL. Yeah. So it just showed that now this is this is where I think that, and this is where UCF is getting better. It's just that on the interior line, they those guys may be a little bit bigger. Yeah. That's it. That's the only thing to where they can have like maybe not even these guys be as talented as our first dream. They're just huge. But they're just big guys. And they have, when people, when the big guys get tired, I have a guy I could put in there who's like adequate enough to be able to step up in there. You know what I mean? And, and be able to hold it down just for the just for the time being. Not saying that he's more talented than us. And that's, that's the only reason I felt like we lost for South Carolina my junior year was that, was the fact that we didn't have enough big guys in the middle to where, like, as soon as, you know, they were running the ball down our throat, man. They were, yeah. like, they were just giving it to us. And we were, it was hot. And we didn't just we just didn't have a fresh guy to throw in there to give a little bit of love to one of the starters, you know? So, like, that that's makes the sense. Only thing I see is the, is the big guys in the middle on the D-line and maybe on the O-line. But that 2013 UCF Fiesta night O-line, all those guys played in the NFL. So oh, yeah. Was, and you would good. say the skill guys are pr- probably equal to the Power Five, right? I mean, the oh, skill guys day. If, yeah. you, if you look at UCF as a whole, like our skill position, I, I get kind of upset when I see, like, I just seen a poll top 10, uh, what's DBU, and I didn't see UCF on there. When our I, DBs are nasty. Yeah. Our DBs are disgusting. Yeah. What? We have monster DBs. Come on. Israel Every is, year. He was a player of the year. Jacoby Glenn won it. And these oh, guys, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Josh Robinson, you got Joe Burnett, Tard Bigby, Cole Mike Hughes, Hughes. Brandon Alexander. It's ridiculous. But, you know, uh, that's just me. I'm a homer. So. Me too. But, but no, I mean, if you look historically, I mean, I did something on one of my page recently. I did, you know, uh, talking about our NFL positions. It's wide receiver and DB are, are like, if we've had, I don't know what it is, let's just say 70 NFL guys, it's like f- over 50% are wide receiver and DBs. So, I mean, yeah, there's no question that our DBs, I mean, you know, maybe we don't have the long history of DBs such as like an FSU or LSU, but over the past like 15 years, we've had so many DBs that are that are amazing. Oh. Go pro. Yep. Yep. We had Tay Gower didn't even Tay Gowan didn't even play last <laughs> he didn't year. Play, he got drafted. <laughs> and got drafted. That you telling us we ain't got talent? Yeah. All right. And then exactly. like you said, and then like you said with the wide receivers, like my wide receiver core, every time I was here was straight pure. I was ball. one of the best ones ever. Yeah. Ballers, we go, we go four wide. We can at any given time. It could be Jeff Godfrey, Renell Hall, Brashad Perriman, Josh Reese, JJ Wharton. So good. And then, J- and then right behind them come Traquan, Dredrick, uh, and uh, Gabe. Like that's yeah. ridiculous. And that's not even counting Mike. Mike and now Jacob Harris, who just got drafted. Oh, yeah, J- oh, Jacob Harris. Like, and then you know what I mean. He's a walk on. Like, 
and we and we're producing that type like it's just something in the water man yeah Mar and then marlon williams came i mean it was i mean it, he's i mean i know he's i think he's not si he's unsigned right now but he had a monster season i mean it, it's you know it, it is really cool to see all this talent going to nfl this this is a, and trey nixon got drafted in the seventh trey round. Nixon. I mean, yep yep yeah trey nixon. And then this year we got a ton of talent at wide. I mean, you know, everyone's a little nervous about it. I'm like, hey, I like this Brandon Johnson from Tennessee. I think he looks pretty good. I mean, Ryan O'Keefe looks like he can, you know, he has we has some serious wheels. I mean, we got That's a good. That's the spin. one I was gonna say. That's the one I saw last year. The kid from Houston, right? Yeah, yeah, from Texas. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. he balled out versus Houston. I love that kid. Yeah, yeah, he's a baller. I like Ryan O'Keefe a lot. Yeah, he's good, man. So I'm not worried about it. So before we get into the, you know, now let let's talk about you were on that 2013 team, which was. I don't want to say the first great UCF team, but it was the first like something that accomplished something that was huge. I mean, you you obviously won the Fiesta Bowl, you won the conf. Uh, well, there's no conference championship game, but you won the conference. Um, you know, the, your only loss that season was a, a, a three point loss to South Carolina, who ended up finishing, I believe, number four in the country. Um, yeah. Obviously, had uh, I'm drawing a blank on the the defensive lineman, the nasty defensive lineman. Yeah, uh, Clowney. Yeah, exactly, Jadavion Clowney. Um, you know. So talk about that season. I mean, I think heading the year before, I believe we were 10 and four. Um, we had won um, a bowl game the year before, but I don't think anyone was expecting that type of year that, that, you know, 12 and one, you know, just running through the, the American in the very first year of its existence. Did you guys like expect to be that good that year? Or was that kind of been a surprise to you guys? Um, I'm going to tell you a story that Brandon Alexander told me. That's my college roommate. Yeah. But Coach O'Leary, before every season, he would write down our record of what he thought we were going to be before the year was over. And he would just put it in a paper, like in an envelope, and then put it in his drawer. And then at the end of the year, he'll open it up and see how far off he was. And he knew. He said, he said, y'all going to, he, he from, from what I was told, he had written down 13 and 0. Oh, wow. But we ended up 12 and 1. And he said, and he put 13 and 0, and he said, possibility. He said the one, he said the one that we was gonna have trouble with was South Carolina, because yeah. he knew what they were coming in with. They had done all that, but I think he knew because of the fact that that's that's our my sophomore year we had so many close games, especially with Tulsa. Oh God, Tulsa! That, <laughs> that he knew that like that would be our like to people don't realize like how getting to a championship, how hard it is, but to lose it is so gut-wrenching, especially how we lost it that uh, that our sophomore year. I remember. You know what I mean? Like, that was horrible. Kamal touches the ball. These guys come off the sideline. The ref blew the whistle. It's just so many things that that is documented that that should have never happened because we were busting their head open all day. Like, not to talk, you know, I'm not, hey, Tosa, I really don't like y'all, but we really were busting y'all head. So, like, <laughs> I, I hear you. Real. But for that to happen, it was just so gut wrenching. So, it, but it really made us like this, like because mm -hmm. we went through those close ones. We, I think that's what set us up for 2013. Like we really were like my teammates are my brothers, so we were really rocking with each other. So like it wasn't no more like when the game got close, like panic. But it was more like okay, we've been here before. So since we've been here before, we know we it's gonna be who makes the most mistakes in there in this crunch time. And we were just able to lock in some most of those games, man. Like Louisville, we were able to lock in. Offense was able to lock in. And then once offense started going defense, we made stop after stop after stop after stop. And it ended up being the way it was. You know what I mean? So, like, I think that was the biggest thing. I think Coach O'Leary knew it. So the way he was treating us, like how his, his sense of urgency was, we felt that. But then also because we had lost the championship before, we didn't want to lose. We wanted to win that conference championship. And then it, we knew also that if we win our conference, we're playing in the BCS. So, like, yeah, dang, like, that's on top of that, we don't want to lose again in conference. We definitely want to try to get in this BCS because if we get in there, we can make some noise. So, absolutely. So, I mean, as good as you guys were that year, amazing that year. You know, you did have the nickname, the Cardiac Knights, and there were some really close games. And you talk about, obviously, you know, there's close games because a lot of teams you played were good, like the Penn State game was close to South Carolina. Game. Um, but like, you know, you had Houston that came down to the very end, obviously the Temple game. What, what made it that those games were so close? Because some of those teams you could see 
they, the, your, our talent at UCF was much, I, I thought superior. Like Temple was at, at that time, they were not a great program. Like they're a lot better now. So why did you guys have so many close games? Why were you the cardiac Knights? Why weren't you necessarily blowing teams out? Not to say that that's easy or anything, but I'm just curious what, what, what made some of these games so close? <clears throat> um, honestly, I felt like because of the, what we were doing at the time, I felt like people really wanted to knock us off. And, mm. you know, if you're not having a good season and you're at a program, you know what I'm saying? You got like you, you, you two and two and eight or you're oh and 11 or whatever, you know, uh, knocking off the team. That's the undefeated team, you know, putting all your effort in and that 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 could make the whole season better. True. That could make the whole season better. So I feel like we were getting some teams like genuine uh, best, you know, best efforts put forth versus, you know, um, just being honest. And, uh, you know, we had those really close games. Like versus Penn State, I felt like on defense we played horrible because Allen Robinson had like 220, 220 rush uh receiving yards on us. Yeah. He was just like he was really the only guy killing us. But luckily our offense was just on fire, you know, and it was just it was just kind of like that. It's like that whole year it was just like this a roller coaster. It was just like yeah. who got who got who got who. And we would pick our turns. And then some games we would just blow people out, you know. We had some of those games, but it just like when we got in those close games, it just felt like, ah, Lee, we're in it again. So let's, you know, we know what to do. But I felt like teams were giving us their best shot during that time, for real, for real. Yeah. So you played four power five schools that year with, you know, Penn State, South Carolina, Baylor, and, um, and or maybe it was just three of those three, but, oh, and, and Louisville, I guess, you know, technically they were power five. Um, what what did you find, uh, obviously South Carolina, I've already mentioned, but then the other three between Louisville, um, uh, Penn State and Baylor, who did you find to be the toughest? Obviously, Penn State's on the road in Happy Valley. They weren't how they as good as they were now. You know, they were, I don't think they were ranked at the time. And then you obviously have Louisville, who was undefeated, number eight in the country. Who did you find to be the toughest opponent outside of South Carolina? Louisville. Yeah. Louisville. Um, Baylor. Baylor was a good team. Uh, but we had such a good game plan versus Baylor. We knew if we could just not let them get over the top for like one of those 80 yard catches and runs mm -hmm. and get their game going in that way, we can kind of neutralize them because once we, once we get them in second and eight, third and eight, now they're really behind the ball because they're used to being second and four, third and two, you know, that's how they can use that, that run pass option really well. So uh, we were very planned, uh, prepared for them. And plus Mark may say we was going to lose by 70 to seven. So mm -hmm. that really, that really ignited us. Like, I was like, and we watched them on film. We, we thought they were good, but, the team, the one team that we looked at and said, like, hey, we got it. it's two teams, really. South Carolina, but you said not South Carolina, but Louisville, man. They had talent everywhere. Yeah. And Teddy Bridgewater was probably Teddy the best quarterback I had ever faced in the college because of mm -hmm. the fact that he was just so pinpoint accurate. He would, he could escape the pocket. And he knew not, and he knew how – he just had a feel for the game. Like, he didn't take too much when he didn't need to. Like, he just knew when to dump it down. He knew when to hit the intermediates. He knew when to air it out. And plus he had Devontae uh, Parker, Parker, who plays for the Dolphins now. And he's been coming on these last few years with a thousand yards, seven years. And that dude was, was amazing. So Louisville was definitely the best team talent wise by far. Penn State, they were they were good. Um, but like I said, offense really put it on them. And, uh, you know, I feel like on defense, we just were like we didn't play as well as we could, but we, we won the game. You know what I mean? So, yeah. That was good. We all we almost defense was almost the reason why we got smacked at Louisville. Lord have mercy. Yeah, but, no, I remember that. Um, well, yeah. one more question about that 2013 team. Obviously, you know, you played with Bortles, who's you know undoubtedly a top five player in UCF history. Um, you know, obviously one of the best quarterbacks ever to do it for UCF. What what was it like playing with Bortles? I mean, you know, obviously his pro career didn't, didn't go as we the way we had all hoped, but at at the time, you know in college, he was probably a top three or four quarterback in the country that year. Um, what was it like just kind of playing with him? It was fun playing with Blake. Blake was just so cool, mellow, chill. You know, uh, he really helped us have to helped us with having to deal with Coach O'Leary. Like, you know, uh, Coach O'Leary would get up, get up in your grill, man. He'll try to really get under your skin. Mostly just try to see what, how you're going to react. You know what I mean? Try to get a rise out of you. Blake's so cool, man. Gotcha, Coach. <laughs> and then he get right back to doing what he does. He was just unshakable. And I think that's what showed when he played. Like, he made, he did some crazy stuff that year. He made some – that throw to J.J. Oh, he got smacked in the mouth. Like, 
for him to for him to have like you knew he knew he was gonna get hit too. And when I when I when I, every time I watch it, I'm like, how did he even get that that far? Like I'm looking at how he threw it. How do you get the power threw, behind it? Yeah. Huh? How do you get the power behind that? Yeah, throw? how do you get the power behind it? I'm looking, but he was just like doing that type of stuff, throwing the ball. He missed the ball, you catch it, find JJ for a touchdown versus Akron. So like it was fun watching Blake. And Blake was a magician that year. Um, and playing with him, he was just so cool. And, um, you know what I'm saying? He just always gave us confidence. Like, we all right, Blake, cool, we good. He ain't never, he never really showed no, like, uh, you know, that heart beating. That, you don't want your, you want your quarterback to be able to rile you up, like, in a yeah. positive way, like Brady. Like, I look at Brady, at Tom Brady, and just, I just see how, like, he just always on it. He's always on go. And I, he's and a leader. Yeah, yeah, he's a leader. And Blake was a leader. He did it his own way. Everybody don't have to be that rah-rah guy. Just be you. So. I think Blake, I love Blake. Absolutely. Well, I have to, I've asked this to both Kyle Israel and Thomas Niles, you know, your teammate, um, you know, everyone has a George O'Leary story, I feel like. So I got to ask you too, you know, George O'Leary was known as, you know, a, a kind of a old school coach. He's tough. You know, he was, you know, that old school mentality, um, but he always had the team's discipline. There's no doubt about that. But what was it like playing for O'Leary? And, and do you have just a good O'Leary story that, you know, that you feel comfortable telling, because I always feel everyone has a good one. Some they're like, I can't even tell you one, but there's always at least one good one that uh, I get told. So uh, give me your best O'Leary story. And what was like playing uh, under him? Um, So I give you a good O'Leary story. <laughs> but, um, what was it like playing under coach? It was challenging. It was challenging for sure. Um, He always challenged you. He always wanted the best of you. He never wanted, especially me playing Mike linebacker, he never wanted me to have, like, show any weakness, like, show that I was phased, uh, show that, like, what he was doing was getting to me. Um, you know, it would be times in practice where, like, we'd be in the 23rd period, I'm, like, throwing up in the middle of the play, like, <laughs> just, you know, it's hot, it's blazing, we're getting ready to play, like, you know, whoever we're playing, we, we training in the morning. And I'm just like throwing up everywhere in the middle of the play. And then my trainer's like running out in the field and coach is like, no, he doesn't need it. He's good. He's the mic. He has to play through it. And it, but it, but like, and I used to be so angry at him, but I'm like, coach, I'm out here throwing up. But then I started thinking about it. Like, you know, he just wanted to instill that toughness in me. He wanted me to be like, you know, be unfazed by even like if something like that was to happen, like to keep going. So, you know, it really, he really built me up in that way. But in the funny old Leary story, that I got is um so we had um we're in Arizona. Uh we're practicing. So we had did two weeks of bowl practice already back in Orlando. We we have been on it, man. I'm telling you, like our coaches had a great game plan for what we we're gonna do versus Baylor. So the whole time we're uh getting out to Arizona and we're going over the game plan and everything in meetings, he's like, he's like, he's telling, he's telling everybody, you're not gonna have time to communicate to your teammates. You're gonna have to look to the sideline, get the call get your eyes back, look how they're lined up and get ready. Cause that's how fast they're snapping the ball. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, bet. Cool coach. I ain't gotta say nothing. Cool. But what happens is when that, when that tempo is like that. So we go out there on the practice field that day. It's out there in Arizona. I'll never forget it. ESPN was out there. Everybody's out there. You know, uh, I forget who the announcers were for the game, but they're out there and everything like that. So like, uh, it, that adds motivation to practice. You want to look good. Now nah, you, yeah. you got ESPN out there. Let's go. Let's go. I want my people to see me. So I'm just out there, you know, I'm having a good practice too, but it comes to a point where Coach Summer is sitting and in a call and I can see it, but my D-line can't see it. So I look over and they, they're like, TP, what's the call? What's the call, bro? And I'm like, <laughs> and then we get in there, but I see, but I see Coach O'Leary like yell, but they about to snap the ball and he's hot. He's like, he, and he, he can't move that fast. He just, yeah. <laughs> over there. So the play goes, but he's still coming out there. Um, I forget whoever the quarterback was going to the team. I, I actually catch a pick and run up the sideline. Mm -hmm. I had no clue that, like, you know, he was coming, but, you know, I kind of, I heard him say that, but I'm thinking he talking to somebody else. Like, he's not yelling at me. I just caught a pick, bro. Yeah. This is something good. So I'm, I, I, I run back and they clear out and, and he's headed straight towards me. Like, what did I what did I do? Plumber, plumber. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you talk to your teammates one more time, I'm going to see you on the first Greyhound bus home from Arizona and you can book it, Ace. 
<laughs> but wait, he was mad that you were talking to your teammates when? Like in the, on the sideline? He was mad I was talking to my teammates for the play call getting in. He didn't want me to have to tell them what the play call was, even though that's normally what I do. Yeah, you're the middle linebacker, linebacker, right? Yeah. So he just literally had just snapped on me for actually trying to help my teammates. <laughs> and I called an interception. Damn. And he did it in front of ESPN. And so they was all looking like they had said it on the broadcast, like Plummer got yelled at this week about, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All people like, dang, T. Mitch can yell that for him. Like, bro, I caught a pick. I don't know. But that's, that's a funny George story. No, that's funny. Yeah. I mean, he has that reputation for sure. So, all right, let, let, let's go into a little bit in present day now. Obviously, you know, the last five years, you know, maybe minus last year, you know, um, UCS played some really good football, um, won a lot of games. Um, and, you know, as someone that I've been in, you know, when I started school, it was 2007. UCF's expectations were, you know, maybe a conference championship, a bowl game, but now these expectations for UCF has gone through the roof. It almost sometimes seems now like undefeated or bust, right? Which is, you know, not, I don't think is a fair standard to live to, but what do you, what do you think fans in general, not, not, not just this year, but in general, what should UCF's kind of expectations of program? Because on one hand, I, I think, you know, we shouldn't accept mediocrity, you know, obviously you can't be undefeated every year, but I don't, you know, I think we should, be striving for the conference championship every year and trying to get to a top bowl game. But what do you think is, is fair? Is it, is it fair to have those kind of 10 plus win season expectations year in year out, or it's a failure, or should it just be like, you know, you know, every couple of years were like that, or do you feel like UCS at a level now where we should be expecting that type of, you know, production each year? Yeah. Um, if you look at the history of the Knights, we're real volatile. Yeah. Um, we'll go from like, 07 where we win the conference USA championship to 08 like not winning Four no wins games. yeah <laughs> you know what I mean so like that was we went through that period even with my group like but the thing is like we won we won 10 games 12 games and then nine games my senior year. so we had went to, we had finally like made it to where like every year we're at nine plus wins you know consistent yeah consistent but then 2015 hits and then we go 0 and 12 you know what I mean so that's been kind of the thing with UCF. Like we'll have like monster year, two monster years back to back, and then we'll kind of fall off. Like, but to yeah. me, you know, you're gonna have you're gonna have a down year, but that down year can't be followed by another down year. Yeah. Like I just I feel like conference championships is what we should strive for every year. That's that's what that was the standard when I was there in college, and I was able to, I was able to play in one conference championship. And I was able to win two conference championships. So, like, within my three years, I got uh, either a part of the conference championship or in it. And then, yep. so, like, winning the conference championship should be, like, a goal that we all have every year. And then, you know, after winning the conference championship, you got to see how you played against your non-conference, out-of-conference guys. And then you will really see the expectation for that team. So, if UCF was to play, I don't know, like, when we get ready to play Florida, and then we play like Boise State or whatever. If we go 0 and 2 versus them, I don't want people to be like, oh, our season's over with. Blah, 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 blah. No, you still have the conference championship to play for right. in a big bowl game, possibly an at large bid to play another good school and beat them. You right. know what I'm saying? But I do want us to win those out of conference games. So if we were to go 2 and 0 versus that, I would expect them to still win the conference championship and now start including us into these playoff, uh, you know, your brackets. Like, I feel like the American conference has nothing but talent. Oh yeah. It's, if you look at the SEC, it's five to six teams who are at the top who really got a chance. And then it's top heavy. Yeah. Whatever. It's very top heavy. It's top heavy. Yeah. I mean, those to that top heavy is amazing. They're, yeah. They're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not lying, but but that American top is crazy too. Those teams that American beat Pac-12, Big Ten, uh, Big Twelve every year. Yes, it's not it's not far fetched. So my my expectation is as a fan, I just want the players to always strive for a conference championship, and then whatever we get after that, you know, is you know off there whatever they do. But I don't think it's wrong for UCF fans to expect the conference championship, but also like just recognize that like if they go eight and five it's not the end of the world right it just needs to be a builder the next year okay let's beat that eight and five you know i'm always about getting better i don't want to fall back 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing where you kind of hit the nail on the head is the consistency thing, because when I was in school, it was so all over the board. I mean, yeah, you had the 07 Conference Championship followed by four wins. You know, it was just, it was, I would love to, like, what I keep saying is we need to be, before we're, you know, the next Alabama, we need to be the next Boise State. If you look at Boise State, man, they win 10 games every single year. They may not go to the Fiesta in every single year, but I just like to get to that where, you know, let's get to even just nine wins every year. If that can be a standard, then we can start building on that. Because right now, I mean, even, even this last five years, we had those three amazing layers. And then last year we go six and four. So it's kind of, again, once that like a little bit of that inconsistency. And now I feel like we have the talent year in, year out where, we should be winning. We should be above 500. Well, you know, at least three, four games above 500 every year. You know what I mean? So I, I agree with you though. Let, let's get that consistency. Let's win the conference championship more often than not. And then um, I think big things will continue to happen for UCF. Um, so yeah, I agree with you hundred percent there. So what, what should, you know, now, you know, year one of, of Gus Malzahn era starts in, you know, 25 days, everyone, I'm excited. You're excited. Everyone's excited. Um, but the expectations are through the roof. I mean, just with the, the amount of power five transfers he brought in, um, you know, the schedule playing Louisville, playing Boise, playing Cincy. Um, and, you know, what, what do you think are fair expectations for year one of Gus? Because right now there is a ton of hype. I feel like if we don't go out there week one and beat Boise, there's going to be a lot of disappointed people. But overall, what do you think should be the expectations of year one of the Gus Malzahn era? My, my expectations is that are that they play in the uh, conference championship. Now, I'm not saying you have to win it or not saying that, you know, uh, if you don't get to it, like, I'm just going to be like saying Coach Gus isn't what we need. Mm -hmm. But I just don't want them as a team to have, like, to be the number two team where they're slated in the, in the uh, American and then fall, like, have a have a crazy fall off from there. Like, yeah. I know the expectation is us, you know, people have these, you know, wild expectations, but we've done it before. But that was with no expectation. Yeah, like we went undefeated. That was without any expectation. When we won the Fiesta Bowl, went twelve and one. That was like we had a, we people kind of we put it down that we were trying to make it to the BCS, but you know, however, it, it just played out how it's supposed to play out. I guess you could say because Coach had already been there and had done what he did. But um, my I just I really feel like with the guys that he's brought in, the coaching staff, the way things are building up, Dylan is. He is, he is, he is, he's a Heisman type quarterback. Yeah. Uh, I feel like with Coach Hypo, they did, they ran a, I felt like I knew the play before it was about to happen. <laughs> Everyone says that. Yeah. I'm you know? just, I'm not, not trying to hate or nothing. No, I know. A lot of deep fly routes and all, I'm like, we need, what I love about Coach Frost was the ingenuity in his offense. He had everything tight. I would see McKenzie sometimes do triple option with AK and Otis in the backfield. Yep. Sometimes I see him four wide. Sometimes I see a tight end package where they're use, utilizing him. Like it was just a lot of multi, multiples to the game with Coach Gus Malzahn being an offensive coach. Like I use this Florida talent, and this speed. Let's get these, let's, let's find it's different ways. We don't always have to get big chunks. We get these guys the ball in space. Let them do what we do. We got Jalen Robinson, Speedster. You got all these cats. Like, you got to use these cats. So, if we got this type of talent and we're in this conference and it's, they're saying there's only one team that really has the type of talent that we got at Cincinnati, we need to be playing Cincinnati. That's how I feel. Yeah, but, I agree. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I don't want to be like if they have a bad year, like, you know, fire Coach Gus because I never believe in giving a coach a year and then, you know, in the, after the first year, you start, you know, everybody's on this. Everybody's saying, we need, hey, get rid of this guy. We need yeah, it's not enough time yet. There's not enough time. But, you know, I do expect when. I, I don't want, I, I don't think, that, six and four just ain't like, I feel like these boys are better than six and four. I feel like they're, like you said, a nine-win team, ten-win team, conference championship type team. I, I agree. Really do. And, you know, and then we do have, you know, in college football, I mean, in football in general, but in college football, you know, the quarterback position is so important. You know, if you have a really good quarterback, I think you got a chance in every game. Obviously, we have that in DG and you're a guy that sacks quarterbacks, you get after quarterbacks. So, you know, quarterbacks and, you know, it is interesting as, as good as DG has been these first two years uh, at UCF and he has a lot of chance to break you know, a lot of record books uh, this year with his passing career, passing yards and touchdowns. But he hasn't really had any team success yet. If you think about it, I mean, the first year, yeah, we won a bowl game against Marshall last year was obviously a, a down year. 
Um, and he's never been to a conference championship. He's never won one and he's never been to a major bowl game. Do you feel like there's kind of pressure on him this year? Like, cause especially if he goes pro after this year, if he leaves UCF with zero conference title, even appearances, just getting to the game and no major bowl games is, is his career, maybe UCF career. I don't know, not in the same level as a McKenzie or a Blake or a Dante Culpepper, or is it doesn't matter what he does. I mean, even if we go, you know, eight and four this year, he, he's still one of the best to do it, regardless of no team accomplishments. Um, how how I look at it, if we're talking about legacy at UCF, yeah, if he doesn't win a conference US, if he doesn't win a, a conference championship or you know get that major bowl win, can he be over Blake and McKenzie, even though he has better stats? I mean, people 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 remember stats, but the wins is what what what, what really sits on your mind to be able to. Win the win those major games like quarterbacks the only ones who end up with wins and losses on their record not everybody else so true you know what I'm saying so like it, it's good to have the stats but like you know we're in we we play to win that's what it's about in the day dominate another team having more points on the scoreboard than the other team so you know I think you know and does this discredit him as a football player no because it's a lot of great football players who didn't win championships in the NFL who were marvelous and gave it everything they got and, you know, did what they did. But, you know, when it comes to legacy, Dan Marino could never be John Elway because John Elway got two. It just is what it is. Yeah. So I just, you know, I love Dylan. I think Dylan's great. Um, I think he, like I said, he's a Heisman capable quarterback, but, you know, in the, the day, quarterbacks got wins and losses. So, you know, it's it's, it's, it's not up to him because he has to have his teammates. And I'll be the first one to be like, hey, Dylan was balling. The rest of the team ain't do what they needed to do or whatever it may be. Like, I won't put all the blame on the quarterback. I understand football. I know it's a lot. It's three phases to the game that, like, you know, sometimes you just can't control because that's the one thing about football. You only play your position. It ain't like basketball where you can take the ball any given time and go put the ball in the cup you got to, you know, rely on other guys. So like, you know, I wouldn't be one who be, who would be like, uh, Dylan didn't get it done, but you know, if he has opportunities and he's not taking advantage of it and something's happening in the game, you know, I feel like he, he the quarterback could have made something happen. Then, you know, could your legacy be better than Blake who beat Teddy Bridgewater in Louisville? <laughs> yeah. can, he, can you be better than McKenzie who took down Auburn and who beat Georgia and Alabama and balled out? Yeah. Just, just keeping it in G. Just keeping it G, my boy. I'm just. just I hear you. Bro. I hear you. Well, no, no you're 100 right. That's why. That's why I had to ask the question. Um, so I got just a couple more questions here. I won't take you. Uh, we'll keep you too long. Um, so I would. I love. I love to kind of hear. Um, you know, when UCF football players are, you know, are still friends and they're still, you know, hanging out. I mean, obviously that 2013 was so special. I mean, so much talent on that team. Um, you know, do, do you, I know you mentioned like Brandon Alexander, a couple of these guys, uh, you know, Jacoby Glenn, Clayton, Clayton Gathers was on that team. Do you still keep in touch with any of those guys? Are you still friends with any of the guys? Are you still hang out? Do you guys, you know, still watch UCF football games together or anything like that? Or are you kind of all, you know, doing your own thing now? <clears throat> no, man, I talk to those dudes weekly sometimes daily just depends i just talked to jacoby the other day it was his birthday um nice. clayton doing good man clayton got a family and two kids he's still trying to play football uh, i expect him to be back in the nfl soon ba was my college roommate i talked to him daily he just dropped a uh pretty great album actually he did he oh nice yeah his music man so uh and he's playing for the winnipeg winnipeg blue bombers too so okay. safety for the up there in the cfl they won a championship in 2019 so He's another one of those knights who got a great cup. Um, Didn't yeah. um, the William Stanback got a great cup too, right? Didn't he? Or no, 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 no. Stanback didn't get a great cup, but he's balling up there. In the yeah, he's CFL. balling though. Yeah. yeah, he's balling. He got an opportunity to come back down from the CFL to the Raiders. Oh, um, yep. He had he had went and did training camp for them, but it didn't you know work out. So he's back up there in the CFL. So you know, I got so many. I talked to Brashad. I talked to Renell. I talked to Torian Wilson. Um, Josh Reese, we got like a group chat. Um, both the twins, Justin and Jordan, Justin Toots. Nice, um, it's like the whole squad right there. Do yeah, you, uh, man, we got man, we talk, man. It, we were real brothers because of the fact that we had to go through so much being in uh, a night back then, had to have our beer shade. <laughs> O'Leary rules, you know, Coach O'Leary rules, you know, waking up in the morning, hard days. It just kind of builds like when you go through that that struggle with some guys, you know, you come from different backgrounds, but we're all there for a common goal. It just builds like true brotherhood, friendship, and 
we've been keeping it going ever since, man. I love them boys. Do you, that's awesome, man. Do you guys, um, I, from what I've seen, it seems like quite a few former players have visited um, campus uh, for practice with Go- Coach Malzahn. I think I saw Traquan Smith there. Um, I seen Brandon Marshall there. Um, do you do you guys ever you know get back to campus or at least for games or um, you know do you do you, or you you you're you personally you do you get to go back? I mean, you're obviously in Florida right now. Um, is that do you plan on attending any games or you just kind of watch them on TV? Yeah, I want to. I want to. Uh... Make a game this year for sure. I gotta be there this year. I haven't been in a while actually. I, last time I came, I just came out there to uh, actually train on the football field with uh, Rashad and Justin and Jordan. Cause that was like, what was that about 2019 when I was trying to get back into playing. So that was the last time I was there, like really at the facility, you know, really kicking it. But now that the new energy's coming, like 2020, I ain't go nowhere. So like, it kind of shut me off. I really had been planning to get down to UCF, so I plan to make it this year. Cause I just want to be a part of the atmosphere. Like there's nothing bigger. I feel like there's nothing big. We're, we're buzzing in everybody's ears right now. Buzzing, Florida, dude. man. Like and yeah, then man. We win these games and like, the, like 2017, I was in Canada. So I didn't get to come to any of the games, but watching the UCF and space game, when I seen everybody phone out there like that and the jerseys and the whole atmosphere, I'm like, my school's lit. This is where, this is the spot. This is the spot. This is the spot. This is the spot. And just so much like expansion. Like, like I said earlier, like from 79 to now, there's no other university in the United States that can say they built up and gotten as much success as us as we have this fast, you know. Um just thinking about maybe, maybe uh Florida State, you know, with Bobby Bowden, RP, the legend man. Yeah, RIP built this team up, but like UCF is just like. We built ourselves up, man. I can't help but smile and talk about us because I was a part of it, and now I get to witness the new breed. Bring it in. Yeah, man, it's so cool. I mean, I, I remember when you know my first year was 07 and 08, man. I was the only you know I you know back then our fan base wasn't great. Let's be honest, like the, the, the a lot of games were dead. Um, you know, didn't have a lot of games, and I think in in my five years at UCF, I missed maybe like two home games the entire time. People always ask me like, why do you go to the games after the tailgate? And I like. Man, I'm, I'm witnessing something special. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm a loyal guy. I love my school. But I was like, you know what? I'm telling you, in like 20 years from now, when we win a natty, I'm going to be like, I was there from the beginning. So I, I, that's my my thing. Um, you know, That's so, real, boy. Yeah, you you loyal. That's what that's, I feel you, bro. True, true gonna, fan, man. True fan. Yeah, it's going to yeah. mean a lot. You said 20, you said 20 years. So 2027, 20, we win a natty. I'm yeah, that that's what out. I'm saying, man. We're, we're only a few years out. <laughs> yep. Okay. I like it. I like it. <laughs> so I got to ask you one more question here uh, before I let you go. So I, I did a post and I never ended up finishing it. I was trying to compare the 2013 team versus the 2017 team. Obviously both are stacked with NFL players. Both had extremely special years. Um, you know, one went undefeated. One was very close to undefeated. Both won major bowl seasons, undoubtedly uh, bowl games. I mean, undoubtedly the two best teams in program history, but you know, let's settle this debate. Which team would win on the field in their primes? Everyone's in their prime and they're playing each other. I know there's even players that were on both squads, but in general, who, who's winning that game? Yeah, man, I hear this all the time. Like some of the young boys would be like, man, our 2017 team was just too fast for y'all boys. And then we would be like, well, bro, like we had Storm Johnson in a monster offensive line. Like, yeah, we monster was, offensive we, line. It was just like a different breed, like in which we played real deal, smash mouth, time control possession Larry ball yeah <laughs> yeah and you guys were like y'all weren't like I don't want to like the thing is with Co- coach Frost like I don't want to say his offense was a hurry up offense but it was much faster than our offense but he he knew how to tempo his game like he had a really good tempo it wasn't just like get up line up throw it get up like I just I like how he did it but like I always get asked that and I, you know I'm gonna stick with my 2013 boy because <laughs> you know We'll never know, right? And plus, yeah. I consider Sukeem like, like everybody may make consider him the best linebacker. But I feel I, I consider him like his two year run. He's the goat defensive player at UCF, and with yeah. his with his leadership and the way he, like Shaquem just was amazing, man. Just for, like the things he would do, I was like, of course you understand everything that comes with him and him not having a yeah. hand and all that. But when you take that out the equation, Jesus, man, he played, he played outside linebacker. I seen him in coverage. I seen him at safety. I seen him down on the D line. I seen him ripping the ball out of people's hands, interceptions. He's a beast. Like, and, and, and the whole time 
he was a catalyst. You get what I'm saying? Like his teammates were like, just like, they would like, he was like one of those, like, I guess you consider him like uh, one of those like generational talents where it's way, mm-hmm. which and when like when they play, it makes the play better of everybody else around them. And that's why I feel like Shaquem had. So like, you know, I, I that's my favorite, you know, and I, and I know a lot of guys probably get mad at me. That's my favorite uh, defensive player you see of history. So that's awesome. But, Honestly, though, I feel like our offense with that big line, man, we'd have been coming straight downhill, man. Oh man, that was a huge, yeah, man. That old line was special. I don't, I don't think there's been an old line that good since then. Uh, I mean, there's been some good ones, but not that yeah. good. <laughs> the 2017 line was good too. It yeah, yeah, good. that's some good. I just yeah, Jordan, Jordan Johnson, I think Cole Snyder. Yeah, uh, Wyatt Miller. Wyatt. Uh, Aaron yep. Evans. Yep. And they and all those guys and all those guys were like freshmen when I was a senior. That's funny. So I, got to, I got to see them come up. So it was really cool to see them boys, man, like really like get that much better in that much time and like really, really, um, I guess you could say just do it big. They went undefeated. So absolutely, man. Hey, well, TP, I appreciate your time, man. You had some really cool stories, some great answers. So I'm pumped for UCF Nation to hear this, uh, this podcast and, uh, you know, uh, season starts in 25 days. So I'm sure you'll be locked in and Maybe we'll uh, do another podcast, uh, maybe mid-season or something like that. And, uh, you know, love to get your insights on UCF. So I appreciate you coming on today. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. Hey, this is the, hey, this guy right here, y'all need him, UCF Night fans. Check him <laughs> out. You know what he's talking about. I like his post. He always staying in tune with the team. And, like, you know, I'm a geek for UCF. I don't care what nobody say. Like, I'm going to support my school. I'm going to learn about the new players. I'm going to see who coming, who going, you know, because, like, you know, now that I, I put blood down, for my university now. So now I'm a, it's, it's part of me. I'm part of it. So, you know, that's real. That's as real as it gets. That's as real as it gets. So, all right, TP, another UCF legend, uh, you know, obviously T- Tostitos Festival defensive MVP, two time AAC first team. So it's an honor to have you on today and uh, be well, my man. You too, man. Appreciate you.